Okay, hi everyone. I'm Laura Kogan and welcome and thanks for coming today. Um, and thanks as always to Lila Catelier for hosting and making sure things run smoothly with these events, but mostly for her energetic engagement with our research and all the projects that come um, out of GSAP. So thanks, Lila. Um, we're introducing you today to a project that we've just launched, Mapping a New Politics of Care. It's an interactive map as well as a longer term project which uncovers the geographies of community vulnerability in the US in the context of COVID. Um, next slide. We're proposing the contours for a community health core of 1 million workers to address both the longstanding inequalities embedded in the social and political landscape of the US and the immediate needs produced by the pandemic. Next slide. We've all been staring at this election map and many of us went back to TV for a few days and all watched the experts gather new data to explain the geography of our elections county by county across the USA in urban, suburban and rural categories, as well as the racialized and socialized categories of how we voted. Next slide. Here's Georgia again. Here we are visualizing vulnerability in four different ways, county by county, this time on our map. And you will learn um, about each vulnerability later in our presentation. But just so you know what the acronym stand for, SVI is Social Vulnerability Index and YPLL is Years of Potential Life Lost. Next slide. COVID affects each of our communities differently, vulnerabilities that predate the pandemic and have fueled its uneven and opportunistic effects across the United States. It was not hard to try to, it was not um, hard to try to take our data back to the election map. So here you can see some provisional things, county by county, highest and lowest in terms of our seven vulnerabilities. There's no direct pattern here, but lots of room for further research. So you can see, you know, there's no pattern really between the Biden and Trump voters, but there might be once we look at it across the whole country. Um, this project began by a provocative article I read by Greg Gonsalves from the Yale Law School, from the Yale School of Public Health and Amy Kapczynski from the Yale Law School. Um, the article was called The New Politics of Care. And in it, they said, we must build a better future, not just to climb out of the rubble of this pandemic, brush ourselves off and start up in the same place we found ourselves in January 2020. The United States is sicker now with COVID-19, but we've been sick for a long while in many other ways. So long story short, we decided to work together. And so together now, this map proposes a new jobs program a program to get millions of Americans to care for each other. Quoting them again, shoring up the foundations of US healthcare by valuing care itself isn't just the first step towards a more rapid, effective response to health threats in the future. It will also move us towards a new politics of care that starts from the ground up in places we live, work, and socialize. A politics that builds power among caregivers as an act of caring becomes publicly recognized and compensated for the productive work that it is. Done right and without the racialized and gendered exclusions that characterize the WPA, these jobs can be a source of power for those who have never been fully allowed a voice in our democracy." Unquote. So what we're showing to today is the result of our collaboration, which has expanded to include our amazing team. We have asked each collaborator to present a very short version of what they contributed to most strongly. Jia Zhang will go first, and she's a Mellon Associate Research Scholar at the Center for Spatial Research. Dar Brawley is the Assistant Director of the Center for Spatial Research. Tommy Thornhill is a Research Assistant at the Yale School of Public Health. Suzanne Iloglu is a Postdoctoral Research Assistant at the Yale associate at the Yale School of Public Health. After they've presented, Greg and I will talk about how the spe spatialization of this concept has helped in conceptualizing further what tasks a community health core might take on. In the second panel is the work, is the work of the CSR students who worked together with us over the summer 
guided by the same provocation, a new politics of care. They zoomed in much closer on specific uh, topics and places to further our research. We'll keep adding to these case studies um, at, uh, on our map uh, in the coming year. Um, I will introduce the students just before the second panel starts. But before we start, I want to thank Greg for this generous collaboration, his dedication to scholarship and research on the one hand and an activism on the other hand is a model for us all. So over to Gia. Hi, I'm going to be walking you through the map we created for this project. So our map has three different views, vulnerabilities, allocations, and comparisons. The first view you see here of vulnerabilities allows us to show you how counties are prioritized according to the seven metrics we have identified and incorporated into our map. This is a map of counties in South Carolina. The yellow parts show the highest percentile rankings in terms of social vulnerability index or the most vulnerable when we use the SVI metric. Next slide. When we use the total number of COVID cases in the last 14 days as our metric for vulnerability, we see that Greenville County now has come up to the top. Next. The next tab in our map shows a map view of community health worker allocations. This view shows how 1 million community health workers will be distributed according to each metric we used. Here's where workers would be allocated if we again use SVI as the metric. Next. And here for the total COVID cases as well. Next. The last view of the map is called comparisons. It allows us to compare the differences between each of these seven metrics using the number of community health workers assigned as the gauge. Here we're comparing between the two metrics we last saw in the previous slides, SVI and total COVID cases. We can see that in some counties, such as Allendale County, next, and Greenville County, uh, these particular metrics we use make a huge difference in the number of workers that would be assigned. While in next, <laughs> while in Florence County, these particular metrics do not make a huge difference. And then here we'll go into more detail about what each of these seven metrics mean. The first SEI, as Laura explained, stands for Social Vulnerability Index. This is a metric published by the CDC to spatially identify communities that are likely to be most vulnerable in adverse impacts of disasters and disease outbreaks. Um, it contains 15 variables that fall into four broad categories. These categories are socioeconomic status, household composition and disability, race, ethnicity, and language, and finally, housing. <laughs> um, YPLL, our second metric, represents community-specific health vulnerability in the United States by measuring rates of premature death. Uh, the state's highest values for SVI also have highest values for YPL. So, next, Medicaid. Um, vulnerability is also reflected by the number of residents enrolled in Medicaid. Um, the enrollment criteria sh share some factors with SVI, such as income, household composition, disability, and employment status, but also have other indicators. And our fourth metric on employment is a data set that's released monthly. Um, as the pandemic has rolled through the United States, the unemployment rate has increased really dramatically. So this increase is a sign of um, economic vulnerability that we, we've used on the map. For many workers in America, healthcare access is tied to the job specifically. So with the rise of unemployment, many have been left um, uninsured or underinsured. I'll pass it over to Dare to talk about our COVID case and COVID related indicators. Great, so in addition um, to these pre-existing or sort of longer standing often structural forms of vulnerability, um, we've also seen that the direct effects of COVID-19 have exacerbated um, many of these. And so to examine the overlaps between 
um, the current ongoing um, COVID-19 crisis and these pre-existing conditions, um, we have used three different ways of measuring the impacts, um, the direct impacts of um, COVID-19. Sometimes these impacts align directly um, with um, some of the pre-existing or long-standing vulnerabilities and other times um, they don't. Um, so first here, we're looking at total recent COVID cases in the last 14 days. These um, highlight places where the epidemic is currently um, very large, um, often directing us to very populous counties, uh, places with large um, populations. Um, normalizing the, the, these values um, by population, looking at cases per 100,000 residents, highlights different areas, often um, more rural zones where the epidemic is currently very large relative um, to the population. And then lastly, um, we look at deaths since the beginning of, of the pandemic per 100,000 residents. Um, this, this measure highlights places where the epidemic has been very large at any point um, since the beginning of the crisis. Um, and so for each of these sort of in, in conclusion, talking about these seven different ways of measuring vulnerability, um, we wanna highlight that they're all incredibly partial, um, flawed and describe some populations um, while excluding others. But our hope um, with this project and by bringing these um, seven different ways of looking at the COVID-19 crisis, covering both um, current and ongoing impacts of the virus itself, as well as pre-existing um, and structural conditions, is to provoke um, policy responses that consider um, vulnerability um, holistically um, in, in ways that account um, for these structural inequalities that have been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, so uh, Thomas and Suzanne will now walk through um, how these vulnerabilities were used um, in our project in order um, to facilitate a distribution of community health workers to states and then um, to counties. All right. All right. Uh, next slide. Oh, they, oh right, right there. So I'm going to briefly discuss two challenges that are intertwined throughout our project. Next slide. So first, here's a starting definition of community health workers for the American Public Health Association to help give some form to the breadth of our proposed intervention. Uh, some points I wanna kind of stress is that it's a close understanding, that there's a kind of a link between the different communities, that they're improving the quality and cultural competency of service delivery, and that it's a lot of emphasis on outreach and community education informal counseling, social support, and advocacy. Next slide. So the first challenge is epistemological. So over the past two decades, there's been an increasing recognition of community health workers in the United States. In 2010, the US Department of Labor designated community health workers with a specific standard occup occupational classification. In that same year, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act included community health workers as a health profession. Fortunately, the literature on community health workers in the US remains sparse, consisting of either broad descriptive accounts or more narrow randomized trials for specific conditions with limited generalizability. Examples range from a retrospective study of high resource consuming Medicaid enrollees in New Mexico over a period of only six months that suggests community health workers improved access to preventative and social services and may have reduced resource utilization and costs to a randomized trial of Latinos with poorly controlled type two diabetes in Miami, Florida. that found that community health workers led to modest improvements in blood sugar levels, but had no effect on blood pressure or cholesterol. Importantly, few studies look at the impact of community health workers across a range of populations and critical outcomes such as death averted or health costs minimized. That said, recently there's been a series of promising randomized trials in Pennsylvania on a standardized community health worker intervention to address unmet social needs for disadvantaged people called Individualized Management for Patient-Centered Targets or IMPACT. And separate from community health workers, while there's a large, larger body of literature on social vulnerabilities and health disparities, touching upon our populations of interest, the publicly available data for these factors has poor spatial and temporal resolution. 
The scarcity of data is a challenge for the field of health policy and our political leaders. We need more rigorous evaluations of the effects of community health worker programs in the US. In general, that is all to say that there remains a number of uncertainties concerning the potential benefits of community health workers. Next slide. So the second challenge is ethical. So let us assume that our epistemological problems are satisfied such that we knew with absolute certainty the marginal benefits each individual would gain from a community health worker. Then given it a limited number of community health workers, how should we allocate them? What is fair? I wanna highlight kind of five relevant conceptions of fairness. Equality of opportunity, desert, utilitarianism, prioritarianism, and pluralism. Equality of opportunity gives everyone a fair chance for access, such as a lottery or a first come first serve. Whereas dessert is based on the idea of rewarding or deserving, given what's due. An example would be reciprocity in which frontline workers are rewarded for putting themselves at risk. Utilitarianism maximizes social benefits and weights all lives equally. Examples could include maximizing the number of lives saved, or maximizing the number of life years saved, such as qualities or dailies, or maximizing the instrumental, sorry, maximizing the instrumental value saved. An example would be such as uh, saving the number of healthcare workers who in turn benefit the health of the community as a whole. Prioritarianism, like utilitarianism, maximizes social benefits, but it differs by prioritizing the worst off, prioritizing the most vulnerable, the most sick, or the youngest, as it could be argued that the young have the most potential life to live and therefore have the most to lose. And under pluralism, these various approaches can be combined. An example would be sufficiency, where the aim is to bring everyone up to a determined sufficient level of health. This is a combination of prioritarianism until the threshold and then any other method thereafter. A consequence of these two challenges, the epistemological and the ethical, is that there is no one correct choice for how to allocate community health workers. This project uses what data we have available now and paints a picture of how different kinds of vulnerability shape the landscape of the US in different ways. And while we can make better choices with better data, we also must be transparent and critical about our methods in respect to justice and fairness. So far, we discussed about different types of vulnerabilities and challenges of fairness. Now we will look at the allocation of resources with the limited data. Next slide, please. In this project, one of the main questions is how to prioritize individuals and communities by allocating limited number of community health workers. We consider allocating 1 million common health workers between counties in the US, and there are 3,221 counties. To do so, first we allocate common health workers between states, proportional to the number of Medicaid enrollees in each state. The current available data shows that the total number of Medicaid enrollees in the US is 76,256,043. So we divide the total number of Medicaid enrollees in each state by the total number of Medicaid enrollees in all over the US. And then we multiply this ratio by 1 million to find the total number of common health workers we need to allocate to each state. Here in this slide, we can see the example for New York, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. And we can see how many common health workers we allocate to New York, Massachusetts and Connecticut and all other states will get the rest of it. Next slide, please. When we look at the results of this allocation, we observe that most of the community health workers go to California and then New York, Texas and Florida follows. Next slide, please. After we decide how many community health workers we allocate to each state, as a second step, we allocate common health workers between counties in each state. Here we will use Connecticut as an example. There are eight counties in Connecticut, but I will use four of them as an example. While allocating common health workers between counties, 
we can use different types of metrics. In this one, I will go with last 14 days COVID cases. Here we, can we go to the previous slide? Please? So let's look at the proportional allocation to last 14 days COVID numbers between the counties in Connecticut. We are gonna use a similar approach we just, I just showed you in two slides before. When we did this, say, when we use the same approach, again, we divide the total number last 14 days COVID cases number in, for example, New Haven, and we divide it by the total number of COVID cases in Connecticut. And then we multiply it by the number of community health workers which we assign to Connecticut, which is 11,474. When we multiply this, we get the total number of community health workers we assign to New Haven and the rest of the counties in Connecticut. Next slide, please. In the website, under the allocation tab, you, we, can, we can choose different types of vulnerabilities and see the allocation of common health workers proportional to the chosen vulnerability. So for example, we did the calculation for last 14 days COVID cases, and when we choose vulnerability as last 14 days COVID cases, the numbers here we observe will be a result of the calculation I just showed you. Next slide, please. And then we can choose different types of vulnerabilities as we talked earlier in the presentation. Here, we can see the social vulnerability index allocation and we can see the numbers change, the number of content workers we assign each county change. Next slide, please. Further under the comparison tab, we can compare, compare the differences between different types of vulnerabilities we choose and then see which one get, which, which counties get the higher number of common health workers. Here we observe that while, while Fairfield assigned the most common health workers when we consider last 14 days COVID cases, Winham assigned the most common health workers when we consider social vulnerability index. Thanks, thanks Suzanne. So just um, uh, before um, uh, Greg takes over, just can you go to the next slide, um, Dare? Um, I just want to uh, point out that these abstract shapes refi re refer to real landscapes um, on the ground and our research is going to uh, take us in new directions as we try and explore things county by county in terms of um, where populations actually live. So, for example, this is the Bronx compared to a whole range of um, uh, different categorized counties. Next slide which go from urban to rural, right? So you can see over here that the Bronx has tons and tons of people while some of these other counties which show the, high, the same kind of SVI range from suburban to rural. Next slide. Um, this is an amazing drawing done by Sarah Zomler and Nelson De Jesus Ubri in my current advanced studio where they're looking at all the counties um, in terms of their categories of urban, suburban, and rural. Next slide. And just to uh, zoom in on four of these that they're, used, that they're working on in the studio. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. And so just for example, this one series of buildings on the upper left-hand side is a, a group of apartments called Riverview which happened to be the highest, um, the, owned by the highest evictor in New York City and was also labeled the Tower of Death because there were so many COVID cases um, in this building. So Greg, um, over to you and just to, you know, and thanks to this amazing team, you can see how interdisciplinary um, the group is and how many um, different methods we've been uh, using to try and understand vulnerability in the United States. Um, but I guess the question for, for us all is what this kind of collaboration um, brings to each, of our, to each of our teams and particularly for you, how this spatial understanding has furthered um, your understanding of what 
community health workers should be tasked to do should um, a program like this be put into place by the by the Biden administration. Thanks, Laura, and thanks to Gia and Dara, Suzanne and Tommy uh, for all the hard work that went into putting this project together. Um, so we see numbers every day coming out across our screens um, or uh, uh, our newspapers about the number of COVID cases in the United States. Um, and um, numbers are abstract. And uh, at a certain point, we've all become numb to them. Um, but I think what's really important about this project is that um, many communities were vulnerable way before we ever heard the acronym SARS-CoV-2. Um, and I think um, we can talk about the social vulnerability index of the CDC or, or metrics like the years of potential life lost. But again, they, they take on a certain abstraction that allows us to sort of um, disconnect from what they really mean. Um, what's important to me about the spatial um, mapping project we've done here is that this puts facts on the ground. It tells us what the United States looks like um, in terms of the shifting nature of vulnerability, depending on how you define it, um, and how COVID sort of does and does not align with, with, with those kinds of um, pre-existing problems that we faced across the US. Um, what's also important is to watch how, how things shift in time and place. Um, we talk about the, the impact of the epidemic in March and April in um, places like New York City and the tri-state area where we all are right now. Um, but now, uh, as you watch the epidemic shift, uh, the, 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 middle, the Midwest and Upper Plains states are on fire. And so risk doesn't um, remain static in space or time. And I think that's something that uh, was incredibly uh, important to think about as we're um, trying to understand how we need to sort of deploy human resources on the ground, right? We need people to be working on the current um, claims for, for, for public health around COVID, um, but there's gonna be devastation left behind and it's gonna be worse in some places than in others because there are existing, pre-existing vulnerabilities that the virus preyed on and, and made worse. And so for me, seeing is believing. Um, as you watch this map and you click through each of its, its seven vulnerabilities, you start to think about how you would allocate based on um, uh, different priorities. As you look at the trade-offs you make when you think about, I'm just gonna deal with COVID cases in the past 14 days versus SVR or years of prevent, uh, preventable life lost, uh, you realize what kind of trade-offs you're making, um, that there are ex existing claims on our resources for health vulnerability that COVID may sort of obscure in, in, the, in the moment of this crisis. And so for me, this is an exciting step to try to think about how we sort of um, represent the sort of facts and figures and the quantitative modeling that, um, you know, Suzanne, Tommy, and I do as part of our work and puts it uh, in, into a picture that people can understand and relate to um, because you can click on any county and call it home uh, and you can understand what the vulnerabilities look like in your own backyard, even though you may not be have access to the CDC data or the background data that we have. You can look uh, through this mapping project uh, as an x-ray of your own uh, home life uh, and your own neighborhood life, your own county life, your own city life. So that's where it ended. Thanks, Greg. So maybe we should um, un unshare the screen. And if anyone um, in the audience has any questions and answers, um, now would be a good time to ask questions. I can put it in the Q&A box. Yes, it's in the, there's a Q&A box. So it is interesting as the uh, Biden administration um, is is thinking about this. There was just um, an article this morning in the in the New York Times, which um, which which outlines um, that they're thinking of starting a much larger uh, testing program and providing much more access um, to testing. And I think it's it's very different to what we're calling for over here, which is the community health workers, which go beyond simple contract tracing into you know, a larger um, world of care uh, in terms of, of healthcare, which is, which is so different. Do you wanna just talk a little bit about the difference between care and healthcare as we're proposing it? So, you know, in the, um, this is a, an honest attendee is asking, what is a community health worker? And I, I, let me try to define it. Let's talk, I'm going to answer both questions, Lord's question and the yeah. anonymous attendees. Great. So first of all, the Biden um, pandemic plan says we're going to hire uh, 
hundred thousand people to do contact tracing, they want to do testing, right? It's a very specific kind of public health task, which is narrowly defined upon um, uh, the needs of the epidemic. A couple of things. One is is that um, most Americans are experiencing the pandemic not just as a crisis about the virus. It's a, it's a social and economic crisis. Um, for all the two hundred fifty thousand dead that we have. There are many communities that are suffering because of unemployment, uh, other health conditions that are sort of starting to, we're seeing the highest rates of measles outbreaks in the country right now. So all these other health events are happening at the same time as COVID and, co and our emphasis on COVID alone risks making us um, uh, foreground the present and, and, and not think about what our, 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 um, our other health needs are out in our communities. Community health workers are generally sort of a, 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 another kind of component of the health system that do preventive care, that can help people uh, learn about their health. They do health education. They can do um, uh, diabetes screening, uh, asthma checks, other things. They're sort of an adjunct uh, to the larger health system that goes out into the communities and works to sort of build up health from the ground up. What we're doing is saying, you know what, in the context of COVID, we're gonna need a lot more than that. We're gonna need things like food delivery or uh, eviction assistance, you know, legal support. Um, we could need uh, domestic violence counseling and linking up to services. So in our conception, we're moving away from sort of the idea that we need a contact, we need 100,000 contact tracers and saying we need a million community health workers, but writ large um, that move beyond sort of just the sort of uh, health as health, but think about the social and economic needs of people in our communities um, so that we can address those needs right now in the in real time um, and allow us to sort of build a firmer foundation for for recovery from this pandemic. Okay. There's a there's another question here. Um, thank you for this exemplary piece of research. Was there any type of data you could not get as open data from official institutions and you needed to extrapolate yourself? And did you take the densities within counties into account while mapping COVID-19? Derek, can you answer? This question? I think that uh, one of the sort of key questions that's come up for us um, over the course of the project um, is the county level scale that, that we've looked at. Um, and I think this has been really sort of the core um, challenge for us is um, that all of COVID-19 data, um, in order to get that at the scale of the US as a whole, um, it's only available at the county scale. Um, and that's really been sort of our, our biggest um, limitation in terms of being able to tell um, more varied and particular stories about um, how this is playing out um, on the ground across the US. Um, because information about social vulnerability and other um, demographic factors from the US census um, is available at finer grain spatial scales. Um, but being able to, to speak about the contours of the pandemic um, hasn't been possible at those levels, except in um, a couple of um, specific instances like New York through zip codes. And we're working um, as a next phase of the project on um, looking at, at uh, New York specifically um, at the, a sub county level. I don't know if others might have um, additional things to add, but that would be the sort of core point for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, this is, I would add one more thing. So one example of place where we had to um, extrapolate data was with uh, Medicaid uh, mm -hmm. by county. So yeah. while you get a lag of uh, Medicaid enrollees by state, it's not available often at the county level. Only a few states do that. And so we used historical estimates of Medicaid from um, the census data. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, did this project look into labor skills aspect of recruiting or training, i.e. addressing the localized social links needed by CHWs? Are there enough workers with a baseline skill set available? Um, this is Greg. No, we, yeah. we didn't. Um, you know, I, I, I think, I can't remember what the, I think we have 200,000 community health workers in the United States at the current moment. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, Charlie Baker in Massachusetts has said he wants to scale up. Uh, uh, I th think he said, can't remember how many uh, contact tracers in the state. Maybe a thousand. Um, so there, there are big scale ups in different states around the country for for sort of contact tracers. We're saying we need a, a larger, more diverse workforce, and um, they're not necessarily going to have the sort of 
uh, only need the traditional skills of community health workers, but a little bit of a social worker background as well. Um, and so there may be um, uh, a diverse cadre of people who we're going to lump under community health workers, but could be, could be providing a whole set of tasks that that extend beyond the traditional notion of, of, of the task. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you for the presentation. This is from Diego and Enrique. Um, of this awesome mapping project, could these maps include observations from local communities with some kind of participation grassroots input process? Well, <laughs> that would be that would be amazing um, if we if we could do that. You know, I think it would be it would be a different kind of mapping project, which is not to say we couldn't do it, but it would um, it would take a uh, you know, a different kind of activist approach to making sort of a partial, a partial map rather than this, you know, map which tries to describe the whole of the United States. I don't know, Greg, have you done, we've done some projects like that, um, but have you done anything that goes community grassroots? We have um, not, but, you know, yeah. It would be interesting to think about how a participatory community research yeah. project like this would work. Um, right. You know, because it's national, it's a little bit difficult to think about how you would do, but it could be like a sub project. I mean, I just brainstorming right now, like, uh, you know, for New York City to think about um, what you can see from maps in a neighborhood, but what you can also see from sort of firsthand reports in a neighborhood as well. Yeah. Um. We in Connecticut tend to do less for school-based health centers. How could we leverage such a useful resource? Could we engage more CHWs in CH, SBHCs? So, yeah. um, so, so we're we're not making prescriptions about what community health workers should do on the ground. I think the one sort of major sort of tenant of community health workers that they should. Uh, live in the communities they come from and do work that the community needs. And so a community health worker program in Connecticut may look very different than one in, in New York City or one in North Dakota, uh, but we didn't really go into details about what each of these kinds of tasks should be, be done. Community health work is sort of defined as Tommy talked about it in the APHA um, definition, um, but we're talking about a whole wider range of tasks that um, could be um, crafted at the local level at, at the state level. Um, Alex, this is a great long question over here, which is that care, you know, just to perhaps try summarize it, that care is often informal, um, you know, and out of the legal system. I think that's what we're advocating for, that care become acknowledged, that the kind, many different kinds of care become acknowledged um, and compensated. Um, you know, so I'm not, uh, I, I appreciate this thing of pirate care and things that happen below the radar. I don't know, Greg, do you have anything to say? Can you see this question from Alex Gill? Nope, I think gone. Dare, I think Dare yeah. wanted to, to, to answer it. Oh, okay. I think Dare, yep. Yeah. I was just flagging for, for others, um, others to answer, but I'll put it in our panelist chat. But I think um, the, Really, I think that others that can maybe now see the answered questions um, with a really great, fantastic link to the amazing work that the library has really sprung into action on uh, yeah. at the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, so I would just echo what Laura has said about, it is about formalizing. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, there are all these mutual aid networks popping exactly. up across the country. Yeah. This is to say like give communities the resources they need to do this, pay people in the communities to do this work, train them to do this work, leaves them behind after the pandemic is over. So when the next health crisis hits um, or just the health crisis that already exists, diabetes, breast cancer, heart disease are, are dealt with, um, mm -hmm. with local resources, we, we, uh, local talents and local skills. Right, and also just to, to quote Greg, you know, he said it in other contexts, like you go to the doctor, but community health workers come to you. And when they come to you, they learn a lot more about your community than otherwise. And community, there's a lot of things about what could, what's the baseline of what community health workers should know. I think they should know, I think, and I'm not a public health expert, but from a spatial point of view, they need to know different things in different communities. So in Flint, Michigan, they need to learn, understand about water contamination. You know, whereas in the Bronx in New York, they need to understand about lead poisoning or, you know, I don't know what 
what what other kinds of things or eviction right you need to look across the street and see what's going on or the person on the corner what kind of um, things they're selling in their food cart that's you know compensating for the lack of things that are in the supermarkets um, so many things that community health workers can do that go beyond conventional health care um, I think that's what we're calling for you know and it's and it's part of the research that we need to develop moving moving forward. Um, but I think we're very close to our limit. Any any last questions or comments or answers from the team to any of these questions? I mean, quickly, SVI yeah. SL, SVI is a CDC de determined index, which you can go to the CDC yeah. website and um, and find that out. Uh, and Martha, in terms of the defined baseline skill set for community health workers, Tommy, in his slide, mentioned the the American Public Health Association definition of it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we, we'd send you to our uh, article called The New Politics of Care in the Boston Review that talks about our expanded ver vision for, for a community health work core. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I, I think that's... Um, that's what I... It's add. linked in the about, it's linked in the about section on the map. Um, and also all the methods and definitions of all of these data sets um, are linked in the about section on the map and in the GitHub uh, repository on our methods. Like everything that we've done, you know, even the biases in the algorithm, we, um, we are, you know, publishing as part of the net methods. There's no magic here in terms of the numbers unless we don't know how um, the CDC did their calculation, but at least we show all the different layers and how those play out. So, okay, so um, with that, I'd like to uh, move over to the student um, presentations, which give, um, you'll see, a much less um, abstract um, view and have taken the research uh, to a finer grain of, of detail. So we're going to start with, um, who are we starting with? With Spencer Crutt and Adeline Chum. And uh, they've done a project called Flatten the Curve, Policies and Outcomes in COVID-19. And uh, Spencer is also a TA this semester in, the, in CSR. Um, second is Nelson De Jesus Ubri who has done a project called COVID-19 and household overcrowding. And he used one specific layer of the social vulnerability index to do an analysis. Um, three is Nadine Fatale and Adam Vosberg, who have done a project called supply chain, which goes into the long history um, of various uh, labor, uh, forms of labor, as you'll see when they show their video. And the fourth project is um, Caitlin Blanchfield. She's a PhD um, student in the history theory program at, in, at GSAP. And she's done a project called COVID-19 and water rights in the Navajo nation. So thank you students and take it away, um, Spencer and Adeline. All right. Hello, uh, my name is Spencer Crutt, and with my partner, Adeline Chum, uh, we'll present our summer project titled Flatten the Curve, Policies and Outcomes of COVID-19. So our project began this past June with an early interest in the topic of flattening the curve. Uh, we knew the flatten the curve diagram itself was a rhetorical device uh, promoted to make individuals conscious of their impact in the fight against coronavirus. Uh, but we were interested in discovering more about the actions underlying the kind of change it advocates for. And we understood these actions to be synonymous with preventative measures or policies that promote social distancing. So in the first month of research and methodology development for the project, uh, we were reminded over and over again of just how much analysis and visualization is being done at the current moment. And we spent a lot of time trying to find a unique approach to looking at this topic of policies that are influencing or influenced by the curve. So it became apparent um, that in order for our research to possibly sh share or uncover something novel, uh, we would have to create our own data set. 
Uh, our project has two main components. It's this new data set and the way we chose to visualize this information. And these both live on our project's website along with a more thorough introduction and another interactive chart that adds useful context. Uh, we examined hundreds of state policies and other forms of published guidance to generate nine preventative measure categories, uh, emergency declarations, school closures, gathering restrictions, mask policies, quarantine or case isolation, stay at home orders, non-essential business closures, restaurant restrictions, and bar restrictions. With our data, we created a research tool pairing social distancing policies with case outcomes per state. This image explains in detail how to read the fingerprints. Each state has a unique fingerprint, which is comp composed of three sections along the same timeline. The top being the state's cumulative case cases per capita count as a bar graph and overall US case per capita count as a dashed line. The middle section is the social distancing policies put in place and the bottom is the cumulative death count starting from January 1st to July 31st. Each state's fingerprint is also colored based on the 2016 presidential election popular vote with swing states being those within 10% difference. When using the website, the fingerprint um, first lands on alphabetical order, but can also be sorted by most cases per capita and most deaths. The fingerprints can also be filtered by Northeast, Midwest, Western PACs, and other states that were not part of any PACs. PACs between some states form to coordinate the implementation and rollback of restrictions. We observed in an initial analysis a correlation between case counts within PACs and wanted to see if these agreements played out. This project's strength as a research tool is derived from its focus on when certain policy types ended and the ability to evaluate case outcomes with that information overlaid. Uh, so to summarize or synthesize, this project is interested in pairing coronavirus case outcomes per state with the day-to-day -day evolution of preventative measures enforced at state level. So since there's not a top-down approach nationally, Directives issued by states vary greatly. Uh, for instance, in March and early April, all 50 states declared a total of 10 different types of emergency declarations, not including wildfires, heat waves, or hurricanes, um, in order to gain more flexibility in their responses to the virus. Further, whether important information is shared in executive orders or by other means by other state departments varies depending on the state. So this project presents the numerous approaches to certain preventative policies related to COVID-19 enacted across the nation, uh, inviting closer scrutiny of our combined efforts to flatten the curve. Um, so for my summer project, um, I focus on understanding the social vulnerability index and the 15 social factors that make it up. These include crowding, unemployment, housing, type, income, and so on. Um, I was interested in understanding how counties were impacted by coronavirus. Um, based on their social vulnerability index. In this graphic, I plotted all of the counties in the US, particularly looking at overall SVI vulnerability. On the y-axis, I located the corresponding state, and on the x-axis, I located the metric of the SVI, which ranges between uh, zero and one, one being the highest. Additionally, I added the COVID-19 count of each state, so the size of the uh, circles represents the amount of cases. This helped me understand how vulnerability based on the SVI and COVID-19 was spread across the country. On the right, you can see some of the, some of the countries that were the, have the highest vulnerability uh, index um, in the current amount. I then mapped the counties that were most vulnerable overall, and then also locating them within the state. So here you can see them highlighted in red. I went back and plotted all of the counties with the same graphic, but only using the credible uh, social factor of the social vulnerability index. As a measure of vulnerability during the coronavirus pandemic, crowding serves as a metric to identify counties with the high rates of occupancy per room. Uh, the CDC calculates occupancy per room at 1.5 1 1 or more person per room, which leads to higher vulnerability of a household. This metric is particularly important during the spread of a newly infectious contagious disease because crowding is an indicator that helps understand uh, a vulnerable um, county uh, rural county on uh, urban and rural scale. Uh, in this graph, you can see uh, how um, counties that have higher number of COVID-19 are also um, uh, 
have high numbers to a high rate of vulnerability based on crowding. Uh, I'm up there again, uh, highlighting the most vulnerable counties in each of the states and the most vulnerable uh, counties overall. Um, I then also map these counties on, um, on, a, on a map that shows uh, COVID rates per 10,000 overall population. So you can see how these counties fare based on their states and the overall country. Uh, I then isolated the, uh, these counties based on the crowd and vulnerability, looking more deeply at uh, demographics, population size, um, their classification, uh, and these range from urban to rural and also range in different um, regions of the country. Um, so today I wanted to focus on two examples that show urban and rural. So for example, in this case, the Bronx, um, which has a crowd and vulnerability of 9 .9, uh, 9, 9, 99. Uh, so I zoom in into a census tract, which also has very high vulnerability in terms of crowding, looking at architectural typology and essentially um, satellite imagery uh, on the ground. So kind of mapping this census tract, um, population, household type, um, architectural typology, demographics, and overall vulnerability. And then the, on the flip side, I shows uh, Seuss County in North Dakota, which also has a very high vulnerability rate uh, based on crowding. And then I looked at the three population centers and specifically focusing on um, Oglala, which is uh, one of the highest population centers in the county. And then looking at the architectural typology, uh, which is mostly mobile homes and single family houses. Um, I wanted to show these two examples because based on the research that we developed over the summer, uh, crowding vulnerability in this case can range greatly from an urban to a rural setting. Um, also just shows us how architecture is implicated in this uh, vulnerability. My name is Adam Vosberg and I'm currently a second year Master of Architecture student. Together with Nadine Fetale, who is in her final year of CCP, we made Supply Chain, which is a video project about COVID-19 and meatpacking plants. So this project started from consideration of spatial clusters that have created COVID-19 hotspots in non-densely populated, predominantly rural geographies of the United States. Meatpacking plants alongside prisons and nursing homes have featured prominently in defining pandemic geographies beyond urban areas. Extensive reporting on COVID-19 outbreaks and meatpacking plants highlights perceived tension between the national food supply chain and workers' lives, supposedly justifying the presidential executive order designating meatpacking plants as essential infrastructure. However, official reporting on the scale of the impact of COVID-19 on meat and poultry processing facilities remains relatively obscure. For us, the state of the data precluded a holistic data analysis, so we instead focus on a narrative supported by certain data sources and a wide swath of secondary literature. So the map on the screen right now shows all meatpacking plants identified as large by the USDA with the gray cross. There are 436 in total. The yellow cross shows meatpacking plants with reported outbreaks, 138 in total, at least as of when we finished this project at the beginning of September. Among those, we picked three plants located in rural or semi-rural areas, all operated by Tyson Foods, and dived deeper into the patterns of vulnerability undergirding them. Our project continuously moves between coral plus maps to visualize our data and satellite images of meatpacking plants and their surrounding areas to show the geography the data abstracts. Here's a clip from the video. Um, so once we got all the data and we started to zoom in to try to look at the demographics of the sites, and I think it took us a short time to realize that the truth, and this is something that can be recounted statistically, but it also exceeds the need for data explication, is that the meatpacking industry primarily relies on racialized forms of labor. Throughout the research process, I was deeply moved by an article in the monthly review, which I can share in the chat, by um, a deeply committed scholar called Carrie Frasure, um, entitled 
poultry in prisons towards a general strike for abolition. It relies on writings by the black radical tradition to discuss the intersection of COVID-19 and poultry processing plants as quote, critical sites of racial, racial capitalist accumulation produced through an unequal valuation of people and places, which simultaneously robs the worker and the soil. End quote. Within this framing, we were emboldened to try to use cartography and data to relate how COVID-19 has laid bare traces of historical dynamics that transformed in less than a century the meat and poultry industry from a household business into an extractive consolidated industry with some of the most exploitative, poorly paid and dangerous jobs in the country. And so we'll take a look now at one case study from southern Georgia, but there's two more that you can um, look at with the entire video. So just some closing mediations on the question of ethics. Our project relies on the satellite view and its ability to commensurate geographic and social difference into a continuous plane from which we effort effortlessly zoom in and out while seeking to connect patterns of capitalist exploitation across diverse US terrains. The dominance of the satellite image admittedly omits the voices of workers, activists, and their organizing and struggles against corporate greed. A coalition of worker advocacy groups have taken important steps by filing a Title VI claim against Tyson Foods, Keystone Foods, and GBS USA, accusing them of racial discrimination for failing to protect minority workers from exposure to COVID-19. Similarly, the labor of activists and critical journalists in assembling alternative and accessible COVID-19 data sets that correct the partial image provided by official sources must be recognized and acknowledged. Our work would not have been possible without them. And also, thank you so much for um, our colleagues in the Center for Spatial Research team for valuable research throughout the pro uh, feedback throughout the process. And please check out the full video. My name is Caitlin. I'm a, a PhD student in architecture at GSAP. Um, and just a, a quick thank you to Laura, Dare, um, and Gia at the CSR and to Lila in the events office for this, making this event possible. And so today I'm going to share my project, which uh, took the form of a paper um, and that looks at questions of, of social vulnerability and care in the context of the COVID crisis, the questions that I think both the interactive map and the other case studies um, have addressed so powerfully. Um, it asks how vulnerability is historically produced. 
Um, so if on the one hand we see vulnerability as this kind of chloropleth geography, I ask um, who is rendered vulnerable and how? And in this project, I look specifically at the Navajo Nation and unpack how COVID um, took hold there as a legacy of settler colonial policies around the right uh, to land and the right to water. Um, so I want to zoom in here on, on three states, actually from the um, politics of care map. Um, this is Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. And, and this map compares um, the, the high SVI rate and um, uh, COVID mortality rates in, in these three states. Um, and we can see kind of in this region here, um, the, an incidence of both high SVI and um, high mortality. And so when looking at, at this pattern, we can ask, ask why and, and see perhaps the geographies um, that sometimes these boundaries of states and counties uh, can occlude. So this is the Navajo Nation, um, which is um, a Native American nation in, that spans Arizona, Utah, and New Mexico. Um, it's you know, roughly the size of West Virginia. And in April, cases on the Navajo Nation started to climb really rapidly by May it had surpassed New York for the highest cases per capita. And though first underreported for the way that COVID data is aggregated um, by county, the Navajo Nation soon emerged as a site of much media coverage. So um, many news articles with you know, images of, of signs uh, announcing kind of new, um, new protective measures and COVID restrictions uh, within the landscape. And the virus also shed light on the underlying conditions that had allowed it to spread. Um, so underlying health conditions, long distances to care, multifamily households, and lack of running water. Um, and this is, this is what my project focuses on. So over 30% of households on the Navajo Nation don't have access to piped water, um, making kind of travel to communal wells and taps or, or households of, you know, other family members and friends necessary. Um, and this is the result of, of really centuries of expropriating uh, Navajo or Diné water and also decades long fights to restore water rights um, in Diné lands and then to create the infrastructure to make access to this water possible. And so here we have a, a quote from Andrew Curley, who's a Diné geographer, saying that when we see statistics stating that 30 to 40 percent of Diné communities lack running water during a global pandemic, they're not statistics without history. The entire situation is an artifact of colonialism. It is the result of decades of indifference, neglect, and deliberate underdevelopment. Um, and so, as Curly states, you know this this is a crisis with a history, um, and one that um, citizens, grassroots collectives, NGOs tribal government agencies have been confronting with particular um, urgency during the pandemic. And so what my project wanted to do was to chronicle the history of settler colonial policies that have attempted to take water from Diné homelands and the work of tribal members to restore their water rights. Um, so basically seeing how we go from a landscape or an understanding of the landscape like this, I mean, this is to be uh, a landscape that, that is still existing um, of many native nations overlapping um, to a history where Diné homelands, which is kind of in this dashed outline here, um, are first forcibly expropriated by the American army um, in the 19th century. And then through a series of treaties and land purchases built back to um, the size that the, the reservation is now. Um, but this is also to say that land isn't just the surface, it's what's below and above. Um, and to chronicle a process of the, um, the expropriation of water that sought to divvy this valuable resource in the, the arid lands of the Southwest um, through uh, laws of prior appropriation that um, allow states to adjudicate water rights to um, private property, property owners and settler agriculture 
and industrial processes. So here we see um, sort of when the, the land entered the jurisdiction of the Navajo Nation and when the water entered the jurisdiction of the state. This was also true in laws like the Colorado River Compact that divided the water in the Colorado River shed among um, the seven states that it went through with no provision to provide um, any specific amount of water to Native nations. Um, and in 1963, after um, a 1908 Supreme Court ruling um, called the Winters Ruling, the, the Supreme Court did establish a method to quantify water rights uh, for Indigenous nations, um, which was done by uh, irrigable uh, water feet. So how much land could be um, irrigated? This was used in the 1970s for Native nations to take legal action to restore their water rights. So in the 1970s, water was taken to court. And what followed was a series of um, water rights settlements where tribal governments are encouraged to um, settle for reduced water rights in order to have access to the funding to create the infrastructure um, that makes accessing that water possible. So here we have a map um, by um, a Diné engineering firm that shows uh, existing water infrastructure, homes without water, and um, proposed new water lines. So um, at stake kind of in these settlements are the, um, the means to build this kind of infrastructure. Um, settlements are a very contested uh, topic and contested issue as many grassroots organizers are trying to push for the full restoration of water rights um, and see water rights as really an essential issue of indigenous sovereignty. And to kind of bring us back to this question of care and the politics of care, um, especially during the pandemic, many of these activist groups have also been um, really at the forefront of mutual aid efforts in the Navajo and, and the Hopi reservation speaking to the networks of care that are, um, that are really forged on the ground. While President Jonathan Nez of the Navajo Nation has put aside um, over $400 million of his CARES, uh, the CARES Act funding that the tribe received to improve water infrastructure or improve infrastructure um, generally, but also water infrastructure. So I think just to kind of close and to return us to some of the questions that, um, that have been asked throughout this, this panel, um, to me, what, what I hope this project prompts is the question of what does care look like um, and what does it take to get to it? How can we maybe think about care in this expanded sense of, of caring for, for water and also caring for the, the treaties that, are, that enshrine the protection of it? So, thank you. All right. Thanks everyone for the amazing work. Um, and we have about 15 minutes for questions, um, for questions for our, from the researchers. No, Greg, are you, are you still there? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Greg, I, I wonder if you have any any uh, comments as well? I know you haven't seen all of these projects, but maybe on, I know that you're interested in the meatpacking. Um, I had a question for Nelson first. Okay. So you saw a correlation between overcrowding and um, COVID cases on the county level. Yes. And so, what was that? Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So that was the, um, at the, when we were look, when I was looking at the each of the counties through this metric, um, one way that I started to zoom in a little closer was um, through the SVI, but also through local um, news article that reported on this phenomenon. So that was like one way in which um, we don't have the the COVID data at census track level or census block level, but there's a uh, reporting that's been going on. And so some some cases um, they've been uh, reporting on how families have been affected by large families that have a large household um, and uh, uh, working parents uh, that are deemed essential workers and how um, 
they feel at risk because they have to work. And so, so join this corollary between um, that vulnerability um, in terms of crowding um, and like the SBI and looking at it architecturally. Yeah, and Spencer um, and Adeline, I was looking um, at the New York Times um, uh, page this morning, and they've actually started doing the um, the updates on mask wearing and you know all of that. But they don't go into nearly as much detail on all the policies as um, as you do. I just noticed it actually this morning. Have you seen what they've done? No. Okay, you should take a look. Take a look. Okay. I haven't seen the full video, but. Um you talk about the racialized nature of, of poultry and repacking plants, but um, is there any geography of, of um, like what's going on around the meatpacking plants and like this, this, it sort of connects to Nelson's work a little bit about how people are in, what kind of living situations are, are happening uh, in these communities as well. Um, I'm, I can, I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I can try to answer that first, Nadine, and then maybe you can add something. But I mean, there's a there's a kind of a, a sort of a long history to that because obviously the normal condition of meatpacking plants with the urban geography in the early uh, 20th century was definitely in sort of like large metropolitan areas, and then it post-war, maybe in the 60s and 70s, I guess maybe in the 80s a bit too, there was a lot of consolidation of taking smaller meatpacking plants, which there were thousands of in the United States, and then and then basically putting everything into like super meatpacking plants that were consolidated by large corporations. And they were usually put in more rural areas often because um, then the majority of cost savings would then be in um, the cost of labor, which is much cheaper than the city. So, so basically what we saw is that like the predominant relationship between um, all of these spaces geographically was just that they were rural. And that was by actually by design, which we found out. Yeah, I mean, we also tried to establish that in some places you can see very clearly that a rural outbreak is almost one-to-one -one correlated with meatpacking plants. And so that's the first case study we have in the video it's clear that um, a lot of the outbreak is coming and then eventually spreads from the meatpacking plants. Can I ask one other question? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. It's about the, 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 the stay-at-home policies and the policies in the, in the earlier presentation. Um, a lot of people stayed home before there was any institution of um, state orders to do so. Um, and if you'd seen any of the mobility data that Uber Media and others have had, that that it just might be interesting to see what that data says as well on top of the um, policy data and the COVID data you have. Yeah, that seems like a really interesting uh, direction to take it. We definitely tried to go um, a bit finer detail in terms of when stay-at-home orders were required just for a certain population, like whether it was elderly or whether it was at risk. Um, but we, we, we simplified things pretty seriously to get it into those nine categories. But yeah. mobility data would be really interesting to see in relation to the case outcomes too. Yeah. Not seeing any questions from the audience. I'm not seeing any, maybe I can't see any, yeah. Okay. Okay. There's no other, if there's no other questions, we can, we can wrap up um, just so that you know we're continuing um, uh, different kinds of case studies of zooming of zooming in on the data. And Greg, I know you're going to be teaching a class around these topics in the in the spring. Is that correct? Yeah. So yeah. so Amy Kipchinski and I run something called the Global Health Just, Justice Partnership with Ali Miller here at Yale between the law school and the public health school, and we decided. Um, you know, Laura 
found the new policy of care is something that sort of pulled her in and it's pulled us in too. Um, and what we'd like to do is to, usually we, we put our class on three different projects and they work with a, a community-based organization here or around the world. Um, the whole class is gonna work on COVID. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back into the history of the United States uh, of white supremacy, of um, how we think about social welfare in the United States, about the role of neoliberalism in the context of um, the American healthcare system. And sort of think about how our past brought us to this present and then think about how we take new politics care and move forward. But with the idea that we would work with groups that we've been talking with this past summer, like um, SEIU, Move On and others about how partners in health, how we could sort of take a new politics care actually into the political sphere uh, and make it a reality potentially over the next, uh, in the next administration, if it's possible to do it with a, uh, the Council uh, Congress. But um, the class is, is designed to take this to a next step to sort of move us from an idea of new politics of care to a, a representation of it out in the real world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the student work was amazing. I loved all of it. It was great. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, it's amazing work, right. And yeah. is, it share, is it shareable, by the way? Like I saw the, the website is um, open, but it's like, we can share that yeah. stuff, right? It's 100% shareable. It's finished as of today. So it's also a launch of that, of that, of the student work from the, from the summer. Um, here's some questions um, for Caitlin. Have you thought about the political results of Native Americans, this political cycle, as opposed to the past? And then just thinking about how much more activism in Native communities is being discussed than I even remember in 2016. Um, yeah, I think, thanks for the question. And I mean, in looking over these, these maps over the last couple of days, um, I think one thing that's, that's interesting is comparing kind of, as I, I think Laura was talking about with Georgia in the beginning, like, voting by um, uh, county, county or even yeah. kind of um, a smaller degree of um, zip code or, or census tract or something um, and how that aligns with, with the COVID maps. I know in Arizona specifically, the results of which just came in today, um, I guess finally. Yes. Um, yeah, they did. <laughs> that, that like looking at the at voting patterns basically aligns to reservation lands and to, to cities um like pretty exactly so um i mean i think in a sense like that i mean I, I think that mainstream media is looking at this a lot more now um in this close election but i think kind of in asking these questions of like um which areas have been overlooked and why i think that um you know both of these both COVID and the election has kind of come up as, as moments in which the media is starting to to notice, um, I guess, things that are affecting indigenous communities more closely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, can I share the screen? Can I share my screen? I think, let me just see if I can. Uh, yeah. I thought maybe I would just end by uh, showing you the, the story map, which is just what Caitlin is referring to. It, 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 um, it sort of explains how to read the map through looking at Arizona. And I think um, here's Apache County. You can say, Kate, Caitlin, which of these are native lands, right? There's quite a few in here. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, it goes, you know, and then it also explains to you all the different um, vulnerabilities that we've included in the map. This is sort of the how to read the map and then it, explains all the different vulnerabilities compared to one another and where the highest and lowest are um, in each of these. And then it goes right in here to some of these native lands within the Navajo Nation and the Fort Apache Reservation. So I encourage you um, to read this. And then it goes to Yuma County um, and Maricopa County, which is the biggest city, um, you know, Phoenix and Arizona. And then it goes to what Suzanne was explaining about allocations, about the trade-offs, about um, comparisons uh, between two different vulnerabilities. And then you go to the map and then um, 
you know, on the map, you can look at the various vulnerabilities. You can also sort of scroll over to get actual information. Then when you go to allocations, um, it goes state by state. Um, you know, and again, you can go through um, a number um, of different vulnerabilities. Again, right, we're asking, we are making a MAC proposal about how to allocate community workers, but we're asking a lot of questions about how one should prioritize um, where to send them. And then here are the comparisons again, where you can choose uh, to compare two different things. And you can also click on the scatter plot to, to get information. You can click on the county. This is all incredibly beautifully designed by Jia Zhang. And when you go to the about page, um, it takes you to an understanding of all the vulnerabilities, um, to all the definitions of everything, and to a large, large set of um, references. So I encourage everybody um, to use this link and I want to send you, um, and, and Darren, perhaps you can um, put the link in to the, to the student, to the student work as well into the, into the chat. So unless there's any other, are there a few other questions here? I can't see. There's a, there's a new question. It seems yeah. like there's some weird timing things happening in the, in the Q and A, but there's a new question regarding um, for the students, for any of the students to answer. Do you draw any connections between your work and the potential green, red or public health new deal? Oh. Seems a little big maybe for. Well, the, I mean, our, the project is the new deal for, uh, community, you know, for public health in terms of assigning community health workers, but the students should answer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if not so much for us, I can say, I think if there was any kind of legislation that we were plugged into, it was kind of the various propositions for regulation of meatpacking companies, which mm -hmm. actually were also quite helpful for like, um, framing of like rhetorical um, arguments about meatpacking plants, but not so much mm -hmm. for um, a new deal. Yeah. Greg, do you have a, an opinion about that? No? Okay. Um, one last thing that we could maybe finish on, this is a question that came in during the previous panel, um, but uh, and maybe is a great place to close is um, what's next in terms of proposing this on, on a policy level? Like, is there a sort of vision for, for who might use this and, and how maybe we can make like a, a plea to them to, to mm -hmm. find it? Yeah. So there's a coalition of groups um, around the country that are, start, that are starting to think about how we take um, a new policy of care and a, a new deal for public health into sort of the political future starting in January. Um, I think, you know, just to link it to the question of the Green New Deal, I think it's all tied together. Um, climate and health are tied together and we need a, a Green New Deal, but we also need a New Deal for public health and they're intertwined intimately. So I think um, going forward, I think the climate activists and the public health activists in the country are, are probably gonna have to have a meeting of the minds about this, but there's definitely a, a group of people who, um, starting in January or starting now, we're starting to organize around um, pushing for a new deal for public health in this community health worker core. Um, so stay tuned. You'll probably see from different channels um, appeals to help us out in pushing this forward on Capitol Hill and at the White House. Yeah. You know, and also while we were working on this, we had no idea what the outcome of the election was going to be. You know, had it been a Trump administration, this project might have fallen on deaf ears, except that, you know, on the ground work would have continued, you know, despite uh, federal, you know, federal funding. But I think with this new administration, we do have to pressure them into doing the right thing. So I do think it's sort of the launch of it has been in some ways perfectly timed, which we didn't plan, <laughs> can never plan something like that too, too carefully. 
So, but it is, I don't know, that people are asking about the, the project. So that's a good thing. Um, okay, can I, oh, yeah. Go I was just going to add like one little comment to the, the question of, of the green, red public health New Deal is I think kind of like all these projects and, and thinking about it in the context of the public health core are sort of like pushing for this sense of public infrastructure that I think brings all of these things together, mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, from housing to, um, to healthcare to, um, to land rights and, and policy. So, and I just to add to to that as we kind of think about, you know, sort of what constitutes an infrastructure um, in this context. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody. I want to end on time since we said everything will end at 2.30. And um, thank you so much. Thanks, students. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Suzanne, Tommy, Dare, Gia, everyone. <laughs>